Delighted to be participating in this series. Um, I'd like to thank Dorothy for hosting this. And Melissa, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, let's all be sure we buy plenty of books today, not just that Rio Grande book. Uh, I do work for the New Mexico Bureau of Geology at New Mexico Tech in Socorro. Uh, that is the state's geological survey. Our uh, mission essentially is to collect information on the geology, the water, the mineral resources, the hazards, things like earthquakes and floods in the state. And um, I've been very lucky to have been able to spend much of my career as a geologist working in the upper Rio Grande part of north central New Mexico, uh, a career that has included the opportunities to write books like these books. So I want to begin with book credits. Um, Bridget Felix over there on the right is the genius and artist who created the river maps in this book. And uh, the credit for its beautiful appearance goes entirely to her. Plus, this book is graced with photographs from, from some very talented professionals, such as Chris Dalberdeen from Taos, who has that cover photo, and Adriel Heise, who many of you probably know. His book is for sale right there on the table next to mine. Uh, both these fellows fly and shoot photos from their ultralights. And uh, that perspective is just so important for looking at landscapes. Now, really at its core, this book is a celebration of the undammed stretch of the Rio Grande. Um, from its smallest rapids to really its most extravagant landscapes. And the talk that you're going to hear today is just a small distillation of the book. You could think of it as an armchair float down the river with an occasional tributary expedition to uh, evaluate some, some uh, wonderful aspect of the geology, hydrology, or cultural history. Now, before I do start this tour, I am compelled, um, David, to show a couple of remedial slides. Um, which hopefully is going to provide all of us with some of the geologic flotation that we're going to need to, to interpret this fantastic landscape. Okay, so here's an attempt to make geologic time understandable to us mere humans. If all 4.5 billion years of Earth history were compressed into a single calendar year, here's a perspective on some of the important events in history some of which I've highlighted. So the Earth forms 4.5 billion years ago. Uh, dinosaurs ruled. Uh, no, the first land plants appeared uh, November 24th, so pretty late in this history. Dinosaurs ruled the Earth for about 165 million years, from December 13th to extinction on the 26th. <laughs> the Rio Grande Rift begins to form late on December 29th. And all the remaining events in blue happened on December 31st. So the Jemez supervolcano erupts about 9 p.m. on the 31st. Uh, the modern Rio Grande uh, wasn't established until about 300 million years ago, so half an hour before midnight. Uh, Homo sapiens don't appear until about 18 minutes before midnight. The last great Pleistocene Ice Age ends at 1 minute and 20 seconds before midnight. Uh, the science of geology is born only a second before midnight. And uh, finally, down at the bottom, the Rio Grande River Guide is published finally as the uh, clock strikes 12. So this gives us an introductory perspective on deep time and an insight into how very slow geologic processes, such as erosion or mountain building, can utilize these vast amounts of time to make huge changes on our landscapes. Okay, now, the landscape along the, the Rio Grande uh, is related to the development of this Rio Grande Rift, starting about 30 million years ago. It's a long, faulted depression in the crust of the continent, all the way from Mexico up into Colorado. As the crust has stretched, these black arrows, the center has dropped along faults. You can see the faults here in this cartoon. 
and forming basins that fill with sediments that are shed off the mountains and brought in by the rivers. And um, magma ascends along these faults to form the volcanoes we see along the river. And it's these sediments that form the fantastic aquifers that the entire Rio Grande corridor is so dependent on. Now in detail, the rift is super complex with series of linked basins, um, three of which I've shown here, the San Luis Basin, the Española Basin, and the Albuquerque Basin, and each of which is flanked by uh, sets of faults. Now technically the Rio Grande does not occupy a river valley. A river valley is carved by a river. These are geologic basins that happen to be occupied by a river that flows through the lowest point in the landscape. And it happens to have carved these small canyons such as the Rio Grande Gorge and White Rock Canyon. Okay, here's a map of the major aquifers in the U.S. And notice the Rio Grande aquifer shown here in blue. Uh, and here it is uh, blown up. How nicely it mimics, if you recall, the shape of that Rio Grande rift. That's because the aquifer has formed within the rift, and the river flows down the rift, replenishing that aquifer as it goes. So, if you want to know anything about this aquifer, you better learn about the rift. And perhaps the best way to study the geology of the rift is to take a river expedition. So, the upper Rio Grande region displays some of the most spectacular geology and landscapes on the continent. Uh, the Rio Grande is the state's flagship river, flowing nearly 2,000 miles from the headwaters up here in Colorado all the way down to the uh, Gulf of Mexico. The first basin traversed by the rift up here is called the San Luis Basin, southern Colorado and northern New Mexico. So this basin is about 150 miles long. Here it is. It's said to be the largest high elevation valley on Earth, nearly the size of the state of Connecticut. So here's Taos, Sangre de Cristo Mountains forming the uh, high terrain to the east, and the Tusas and San Juan Mountains off to the west. Tonight we're only going to tour this small section of the Rio Grande, but arguably it's a section with the finest scenery and the best geology. At least I would argue that. Okay, here's the geologist's palette for this expedition. This is a Google Earth image uh, looking south that shows the lay of the land for this 153 mile expedition. So starting here in the Alamosa Valley, uh, the river cuts through these old volcanoes of what's called the San Luis Hills, southern Colorado, then crosses this young volcanic terrain across the Taos Plateau, whereupon it plunges into the deep gorge between Cuesta and Taos. It encounters these mountains, Picaris Mountains, and takes an abrupt right turn, then flows across the gentle plains of the Española Valley, not too far from here whereupon it descends into the deep canyon at White Rock Canyon, here are the Jemez Mountains, until finally the water is stilled by Cochiti Dam. So, the River Guide, the book, divides this trip into 11 sections, each of which is unique and worthy of a visit. So we begin our journey down a rather sluggish river here in the Alamosa, uh, Alamosa Valley of Colorado. This is a view south. Uh, many miles of slow, meandering Class I uh, flat water. However, from the air, um, we see that the geology here is not Class I, it's more like Class III. And this is a, a lavish Adriel Heise photo that demonstrates this beautifully. Notice all of these meander scars. These are all old river channels. These oxbow lakes are even more modern river channels. This indicates to us that this river has been aggressively moving back and forth across this valley for hundreds and thousands of years. Now until about 300,000 years ago, this valley was covered by an enormous lake. And um, that lake in fact contributed to these exceedingly fertile soils that you see up here, uh, which are farmed for potatoes, lettuce, and alfalfa. 
and perhaps most importantly, uh, most of the barley for the Coors Brewery. Now, the history of this lake is fascinating, and uh, I'd like to spend just a moment <coughs> on it. Um, Pleistocene Lake Alamosa, here's Taos, again for reference, here's Colorado line. This Lake Alamosa formed behind a volcanic dam, the San Luis Hills. And on the right is a recreation. This is a Google Earth image with that uh, lake at its high stand superimposed uh, on the image. Uh, this was a fantastic lake. It was 65 miles long. It was 150 feet deep. It probably was in existence for at least 3 million years. All the while it was expanding and contracting as the glacial, as the climates changed. And in its day, it's said to be one of the largest high-altitude lakes in North America. <coughs> now, incidentally, New Mexico also had a Pleistocene lake, much smaller. Uh, it was named Sunshine Lake and occupied this valley here south of Ute Mountain, just north of Taos. Um, notice that 650,000 years ago, there is no Rio Grande and no Rio Grande Gorge going up to Colorado. In fact, while these lakes were in existence, this is the ancestral Rio Grande, the headwaters of the Rio Grande were actually the Red River, their Cuesta. Then about 300,000 years ago, uh, the river, uh, during a wet climatic uh, episode, Lake Alamosa overtopped its volcanic dam quickly cutting a gorge through the rocks, spilling southward, eroding, uh, starting to erode the gorge, whereupon, notice the Red River now is demoted to tributary status, and we have a through-going Rio Grande all the way from source to sea. This is the first time that we had the modern incarnation of this fully integrated river to the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. The Ute Mountain Run is one of my personal favorites. It's 25 miles through a remote uh, igneous canyon. It's best enjoyed at low water, uh, such as inflatable kayaks, especially because at the end of the trip, you have to carry all of your gear out of the gorge. Now, the lower half of this run, um, south of Ute Mountain, contains some of the most fascinating springs in the state of New Mexico. And here's the setup for that. From southern Colorado, this Lobatos gauge, down to the Embudo gauge, a distance of about 80 miles, the Rio Grande gains about 124 CFS, cubic feet per second, from spring water. That's over 55,000 gallons per minute. That's a lot of water, and it's the water that can keep the river uh, wet and the fish breathing when Colorado is diverting most of the river. The details of how and where this river gain, this spring gain, occurred had never been studied. And so in 2007, with the support of the Interstate Stream Commission, who's very interested in those springs, um, we eagerly undertook a study uh, of the springs, especially because we could do a lot of the work in inflatable kayaks. Uh, here we are examining, inventorying, measuring this small spring that comes out just at the level of the river. So we ended up cataloging an unexpectedly large number of springs in this study, 170 springs, and we certainly did not find them all. They ranged from trickles to gushers that gushed out thousands of gallons per minute, uh, from hot to cold, from young to old. Yes, we can date water. And um, they represented a great variety of geologic settings, so all kinds of reasons, different reasons why the springs were where they were. We encountered lots of uh, special springs in this study. Today I'm only going to have time to show you one, but it's a real uh, beauty. This is a view upstream uh, of the lower end of what we call the Ute Mountain Spring Zone. And the blue arrow points to the largest spring in this zone, which we named Lava Tube Spring and which actually emerges from the riverbed. Oops. So, because the vent is located in the river, it's not directly visible. However, the spring is strongly artesian, which creates some spectacular special effects in the river. 
the pressure of the upwelling water from the bottom of the river has flushed out all the fine sediment so that there is a crater in the bed of the river that's 12 feet across and 15 feet deep. The crater contains these spectacular dancing plumes of gravel that look like volcanic eruptions. You can see one of those right here in the middle of this crater. And uh, this is an underwater shot of one of those uh, plumes. Now the largest rocks here are about an inch across. This spring pumps out an amazing 13 CFS. That's nearly 6,000 gallons per minute. And for comparison, the half-inch garden hose that you have at home puts out about 10 gallons a minute. The largest hose on a fire truck puts out about 1,000 gallons per minute. Uh, so this spring could fill one of those large tanker trucks in about 90 seconds. Wow. Now, to sample the spring, we fashioned a, a long piece of PVC, which was crammed into the vent in the riverbed by this enthusiastic graduate student. <laughs> the uh, artesian pressure of the spring water was such that, lo and behold, water ascended to several feet above the level of the river. This was one of the coolest things I had ever seen in nature. And uh, it turned out that day that the water was so clear that I shot a short video, underwater video of this. It sounds like a freight train. And here it is. stationary. see the plumes are coming just almost to the surface. Yeah, people applaud when they see this uh, video. It's truly an amazing phenomenon. So, one possible geologic model for this remarkable spring is shown here in this geologic cross-section, and um, where a lava tube, shown here in orange, uh, contains pressurized water, and this is a blow-up of the area where the river has intersected that lava tube, and so the pressurized water moves upwards. Lava, tube form, lava tubes form when lava flows below the surface, such as here in Hawaii, and this is what a modern Hawaiian uh, lava tube looks like. So, are there lava tubes on the Taos Plateau? Well, indeed there are, including a famous one. San Antonio Mountain Cave, which is, not, is located not far from the spring, um, has an entrance that is a part, as a collapsed part of the cave. And here's a person for scale. So this is a large lava tube. And this cave is renowned for its Pleistocene fossil assemblage, which has revealed a lot of information about the early climate here. And here's a large lava tube um, that's located in the cliffs uh, along a Taos box in the gorge. So, how big is the spring? Well, at 6,000 gallons per minute, it dwarfs the famous Ojo Caliente spring and the Gila Hot Springs. The next largest spring in the state is uh, probably Lee Lake, down near Roswell, which uh, a zone of karst springs feeds this lake, and it's been measured recently at about 5,700 gallons per minute. Although, 130 years ago, the great karst aquifers of the Roswell Basin supported five immense artesian springs, which fed the North and South Spring Rivers. Here's a 1904 photo of the North Spring River, which in 1867 was described as being 60 feet across and 20 feet deep. 
the largest of the five Roswell Springs discharged an astounding 38,000 gallons per minute. That's 85 CFS until massive irrigation withdrawals uh, in the late 1880s led to catastrophic groundwater declines. And by 1931, all five of these great Roswell Springs were bone dry. So, uh, by default, I think I can claim that Lava Tube Spring is probably the single largest spring in the state of New Mexico. And even if it isn't the largest, it deserves to be um, classified as one of the natural wonders in New Mexico. Okay, next down is the Razor Blades. This is six miles of Class 4 plus whitewater through a volcanic wonderland that surrounds the BLM Wild Rivers Recreation Area. This is a view north, uh, a Google Earth image, looking upstream. And so each one of these uh, mountains and hills is a young volcano dated at about five to three million years old. And the plateau itself is committed, is composed almost entirely of lava flows. So uh, let's take a closer look at these volcanic rocks. The so-called Taos Plateau volcanic field <coughs> extends from just about Taos uh, all the way to Antonito. Um, it consists of more than 40 separate volcanoes shown here in the red dots that erupted many different kinds of magma and formed a variety of shapes of volcanoes. For example, uh, there's the massive steep-sided lava dome, Ute Mountain, that dominates the skyline north of Taos. Uh, and here are these thick stacks of very thin basalt flows uh, named the Servietta Basalt that are seen along the walls of the gorge near Taos. Now, uh, if you float or hike any of this country, uh, you become well acquainted with this Servietta Basalt. Here it is. Taos County would not have been a pleasant place to live uh, five to three million years ago. Uh, a cluster of volcanoes near Tres Piedras um, was pumping out huge volumes of lava. And the lava was similar in character that uh, that which is currently coming out of the, uh, the Hawaiian Islands. And uh, these flows move fast. They could travel tens of miles before solidifying. And these ultimately covered the Taos Plateau with about 50 cubic miles of this blistering black lava. Now the Servietta is known as ropey lava or poihoi and uh, it solidifies into these fantastic textures. The basalt also excels as an art medium. The river carves it beautifully, polishes it, and of course early uh, human occupants used it also. Now, next down is the upper box. This is seven miles of absolutely unforgiving uh, class five and class six rapids set in this gorgeous canyon. This is a view upstream in the BLM Wild Rivers Recreation Area, which if you have not been there, I highly recommend a visit, day visit or camping. You can hike into the gorge, or if not, you can just enjoy the view from the top. And this is Servietta Basalt exposed in the walls of the canyon. Now through a series of curious geologic uh, events, this section of the river displays a dramatic gradient change known to geologists as a river nick point. And uh, this nick point, uh, contain, the, the canyon contains this almost continuous uh, series of uh, white water that is navigable only by the most skilled and determined and fearless of boaters such as these kayakers heading into Hell Hole. <laughs> this is an elevation profile from Colorado down to Embudo. The blue line is the elevation of the river. And this nick point is quite obvious when you see this perspective. Um, some of the gradients in here, local gradients, are over 200 feet per mile of drop. And this area contains the most formidable rapids on the Rio Grande. Now, I've also shown the profile of the uh, east side of the gorge here. And you can see how the gorge deepens dramatically right when the nick point starts. This is another terrific Adriel Heise photo taken from his ultralight of La Junta Point in this BLM uh, recreation area. At the confluence of the geomorphologically twin Red River and Rio Grande, 
this is a fantastic place to visit, and you can hike down from this point all the way down to the confluence of these two beautiful rivers. Now, although this middle box section is lovely and it's really fun to paddle it, it's rarely visited by boaters because you have to haul your stuff down 800 feet down a primitive trail to the launch site, which is right here. Where is this park? Where is that exactly? That's uh, near Cuesta, just west of Cuesta. Now, in contrast, uh, the Taos Box draws visitors from all over the world. This stretch of river is arguably the finest whitewater day run in, in the entire U.S. and perhaps in North America, and certainly one of the most scenic from above. Adding to its allure is this award-winning bridge uh, and two riverside hot springs, um, but the real draw, of course, to the Taos Box is the rapids. So. The grand finale on the Taos Box is a three and a half mile section of sustained whitewater, starting with this 12 foot drop at Powerline Falls. This so called Rio Bravo section is really, really fun, although at high water, in kind of a, almost a terrifying way, um, there are plenty of uh, hazards on this run. Um, but fortunately, if things go wrong and you flip your raft like this poor fella has, you can always count on the fabled Rio Grande River Rescue. <laughs> they don't grow that big anymore. <laughs> and the river holds more hazards ahead, especially in one long boulder infested section of whitewater. The most technically challenging uh, run known as the Rock Garden. Although um, some guides tell me that with the introduction of all kinds of invasive species that they're starting to call it the croc garden. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, rafting has its risks. I sometimes wonder how we lived without Photoshop in the past. <laughs> but seriously, if you've never experienced the thrills of the Taos Box, book yourself a commercial trip this spring. It's the most excellent whitewater adventure, especially in a, in a small paddle boat. Now, in contrast, El Rio Verde is a lovely, gentle section of water that flows through BLM's uh, Rio Grande Gorge Recreation Area. This stretch of the river is notable for lots of reasons, and I'm going to list two. First, it contains the oldest spring water that we found in our inventory of springs. It was dated by carbon-14 at 19,000 years. So that's Pleistocene water, that's ancient fossil water, and it indicates there's a very complicated groundwater plumbing system under this part of the, uh, in this part of the Rio Grande Rift. And secondly, this area was critical to our nation's program for, for exploration of the moon. Now, the Apollo moon missions were basically very fancy geologic field trips. And the astronauts, though, except for New Mexico's Harrison Schmidt, were not geologists, so they had to have extensive geologic training. Apollo 15 represented the start of the so-called big science missions, which were long-duration visits to the lunar surface with a dune buggy and an emphasis on geologic exploration and sampling. And NASA needed a moon-like place to train, and so the Taos Plateau is one of the places that was selected. This is the Apollo 15 crew uh, sampling along the Rio Grande Gorge in 1971. You probably can't see it, but they're actually sam sampling an anthill. Um, they were taught what to sample, how to sample, and how to document their sampling through photography. Also, you might just be able to see these big Hasselblad uh, cameras that are strapped to their chests. Now the rim of the Rio Grande Gorge was chosen due to its similarities with the Hadley Rill, which was the Apollo 15 landing site. And uh, similarities in the rocks themselves, this is a Serviette basalt from Taos, and this is a lunar basalt. These Taos trained astronauts returned with 170 pounds of moon rocks, uh, including the so-called Genesis rock that was determined to be 4.5 billion years old, so nearly as old as the Earth itself. Very important sample. 
NASA continued to train in Taos for Apollo 16, which featured veteran astronaut Captain John Young. Uh, here's Captain Young driving the dune buggy up there. You can see the gorge in the background, Sangre Cristo is on the skyline. Um, he later performed geologic field work on the moon, returning with 211 pounds of rocks. He was also commander of the first shuttle mission in 1981, and uh, he holds many other space firsts. Now, you might be surprised to learn that astronaut training in Taos continues to the present day. In 1998, I was fortunate enough to be uh, become involved as an instructor for NASA astronaut training uh, in planetary exploration. And uh, all 76 of the astronauts that have joined NASA since then have come through our Taos training program. Here's a flock of astronauts uh, on Taos Pueblo a few years ago posing uh, with some tribal officials over here. Uh, here's veteran astronaut and two-time space uh, walker, uh, Dr. Stan Love, who's an astrophysicist, who just came out for fun to assist us with a hydrology program at Ponce de Leon uh, Hot Springs in Taos, um, summer before last. Now, one of my favorite times ever was hanging out with Captain John Young when he came, when he flew out to observe the exercise back in 1999. You know, really, after all, how often does one get to hang out with a genuine American moonwalking hero? And he seems to have kept the same hat for 30-some <laughs> years. <laughs> okay, the race course is the most popular section of the Rio Grande. Even though it's less than five miles long, it's absolutely packed with thrilling rapids and fantastic geology. At the village of Pilar, uh, there's Steve Harris's house, is right, right there. At the village of Pilar, the river takes this dramatic, sudden right turn due to the obstruction created by the Pilar Cliffs of the Picaris Mountains, which are composed of 1.6 billion-year-old rocks. Now compare that to the Serviette basalts that sit over here on the opposite side. Those are about 3 million years. So the rock units here are juxtaposed along a major fault known as the Imbuyo Fault which separates the San Luis and the Española rift basins. The river follows the fault westward here, and then uh, both the river and the fault turn southward uh, into the Española Valley, and this fault becomes the Pajarito Fault, which runs under some of the sensitive uh, laboratories and such up at Los Alamos. Now for you rock hound stuff, Pilar Cliffs host a suite of unusual and colorful minerals, things such as piedmontite, uh, viridine, tourmaline, and even emerald, and dozens of others. Uh, plus, the schists high up here on the cliffs contain some classic metamorphic minerals, such as these beautiful faceted garnets, and things like this fairy cross starlite, which is a mineral sold in many of the rock and gem shops in Santa Fe and Taos as good luck charms. Okay, here's the geologist's favorite road sign. <laughs> this is always a pretty good indicator of an active geologic environment, which is what we like. So this is a view west along those Pilar cliffs. And uh, the cliffs here are notoriously unstable, and periodically they fall onto the highway and into the river. My favorite such event happened in uh, July of 1991, when after three days of rain, uh, there were 11 debris flows triggered, uh, dozens of rock falls along a five-mile stretch of the highway here. And the highway was closed for 19 hours. Uh, there were cars trapped in between. And uh, incredibly, though, nobody was hurt. The next morning, rafters discovered this 360-ton <laughs> schist boulder at Big Rock Rapid, and they uh, named it for some reason Baby Huey. During the night, this boulder had tumbled a thousand feet down the cliffs, whereupon it bounced off the highway we calculated at about 50 miles per hour. It blasted a 15-foot deep crater in the road before skipping across the river at this rock here, skipped right across embedded in the far side. Now here's a, a view back up the cliffs, and you can see the path 
of Baby Huey. When I saw it, I knew immediately where this rock had come from because I would mapped all of these rocks. It's a distinctive garnet starlight schist, and I knew it came from up here. Now, notice this triangular deposit of debris, other big rocks here. This is called a debris fan, and it indicates there have been lots of such rock falls here in the past, and that this certainly won't be the last time that the schist hits the fan. <laughs> what? Here on the race course. Sorry, I can... There aren't that many good geology jokes. <laughs> now, also during that night in 1991, uh, the Rio Grande was actually dammed for a short time by a large debris flow at Sleeping Beauty Rapid. And uh, I took this photo two days later. You can see the debris flow. It took the river very little time to cut this channel at the far side. Uh, and within a few years, most of this debris had been removed. OK, in the late 1890s, a fellow by the name of Glenn Woody discovered gold in the metamorphic rocks of the Pilar Cliffs. Uh, in 1902, he returned from the Klondike, where he'd been prospecting, to start raising Eastern Venture Capital to, uh, to have a big gold mine here. He laid out a small town on the north side, built a bridge. He built a diversion for water, a ditch and a flume, to power this state-of-the-art cyanide leach mill that he built here on the slopes by the river. He uh, mined gold up here in the, the workings, moved it down these roads, and fed it through the mill of Via Gravity. Um, as it turned out, the gold was much lower grade than he had claimed, and the operation quickly went belly up. Uh, these photos were taken 108 years apart from the same spot, and today, Really, you can drive this road or float this river and see almost no evidence now of this operation. So the race course also contains some puzzling wetlands, or cienegas, on the North Canyon wall. This is an aerial view uh, from Pilar down to the county line. So this is the race course run. Note these green patches that are scattered along the side of the canyon. Each one of these is a beautiful, verdant, spring-fed wetland. And uh, the upper photo shows a close-up of one of these, um, which are really havens of biodiversity in this uh, environment. And the rock and soil here are saturated by the spring water. And so the entire area is slowly oozing downwards um, by a geologic process that we call creep. And significantly for boaters, the, um, one of these wetlands here, South Hole, uh, or the, the South Hole wetland is responsible for the largest and last uh, rapid on the race course. South Hole is really a gorgeous rapid, and it's totally unique geologically. It exists because this is the saturated wetland, is oozing downward. And very importantly, it's pushing these huge boulders in front of it, uh, severely constricting the river channel. So until a really big river flows, a huge river flow comes through here, a flood level flow to move these big rocks out, this is just going to get smaller and narrower, and the rapids just going to get bigger and better. And in the meantime, South will continue to provide these kinds of thrills and spills, you can see. Um, this is a great shot with this phantom leg in the water. I like this shot too because none of the passengers have their paddle in the water except for the guide here in the back of the boat. And uh, this boat, which uh, looks like it's being pulled back into this hydraulic reversal. And during the spring of 2005, when there was over 5,000 CFS coming through here, a very good water year, um, it said that four out of five boats, rafts, were flipping at South Hole, and people lined up along the, um, along the rapid. Uh, it was great entertainment if you were high and dry. Okay, 
Uh, in contrast, the Bosque Run past Embudo is a lovely, placid stretch of river along which the popular Chile Line uh, narrow gauge ran between Santa Fe and Antonito from 1887 to 1941. But really, Embudo's true claim to fame is that it was the location of the first gauging station in the U.S., first stream gauge. And the story here is that in 1888, at the urging of USGS Director Major John Wesley Powell, Congress authorized the nation's first hydrographic survey. <clears throat> in December of 88, 14 young engineers recently graduated from Eastern colleges assembled in Embudo. They spent the winter at Camp Embudo in tents on the north side of the river. In January of 1889, uh, the first stream gauge was installed, and it said that John Wesley Powell himself came out to visit, oversee that operation. And these pioneers developed pretty much all of the modern techniques that we use to gauge streams, including, for example, uh, using cables uh, to determine velocity profiles across streams. Several gauges were built in Embudo. Uh, I'll show a picture here of the 1912 gauge that sat on the side of this old wagon bridge. And after completing their studies in Embudo, these engineers fanned out across the U.S. to uh, begin to train all the engineers that were needed to uh, gauge uh, the rivers of this entire nation. Now the Velarde section, which runs through Española, is not often paddled uh, due to slow water and bridges and a lack of uh, public lands. And uh, perhaps most importantly, several of these river-wide irriga er, uh, irrigation diversions that are created mostly like this one of just big, jagged pieces of serviette basalt. Now, what are we crossing is of particular significance, both historically and hydrologically. Uh, much of the historical significance is attached to the bridges that have been built there and the local inhabitants. Um, here's the 1887 trestle, uh, the, the beautiful 1924 suspension bridge, the 1948 steel truss bridge, and the very ugly modern bridge. And hydrologically, uh, it's the single most important stream gauge in the state of New Mexico is located on the piers of uh, the 1887 bridge. Here it is, modern day. Um, this gauge was installed in 1895. Um, it was installed and it's used to establish New Mexico's water delivery obligations to Texas via Elephant Butte Reservoir according to the 1938 Interstate Compact that controls and regulates water use along the Rio Grande. Next time you draw, drive to Los Alamos, you can look to the left and see this gauge. Now, the last section is White Rock Canyon, which displays a fantastic collage of geology and landscape that's absolutely different from anything up above. This is a false color satellite image of, of that area. Uh, here are the Jemez Mountains off to the west, the big canyons, uh, that cut the Pajarito Plateau down to the Rio Grande. Here is White Rock. Here is Los Alamos. Down here is Cochi Dam, Cochi Reservoir. And here are the then outskirts of Santa Fe. Now, notice this large area of these wild colors and patterns. This is the Cerros del Rio volcanic field, which contains at least 60 separate distinct volcanoes. So here the river is sandwiched between two major volcanic fields, the Jemez Mountain supervolcano and this Cerros del Rio. And not surprisingly, if you hike or paddle through here, you see lots of evidence of a, a really explosive energetic geologic past. The Jemez Mountains, of course, are a single large volcanic complex that began forming about 16 million years ago. Its iconic rock is the Bandelier Tuff, which forms much of the Pajarito Plateau. It erupted during two titanic, titanic eruptions, 1.6 and 1.2 million years ago. And when supervolcanoes explode, they emit uh, huge hot clouds of gas, gas and ash, uh, and pumice, 
called pyroclastic flows that can travel at 200 miles per hour, and um, their temperatures can exceed 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and upon cooling, they can form tufts such as the bandolier, which oftentimes are suitable for things like cliff dwellings. Now, after this tuft erupted, it left a gorgeous 14-mile wide circular depression that we now call the Valles Caldera. And it was after these great eruptions that the river itself excavated this last modern uh, White Rock Canyon, which is just the latest in several incarnations of White Rock Canyons, of, of earlier White Rock Canyons. Now, most boaters launch at Buckman, uh, a crossing, another crossing of special historical interest, and now also the location of the somewhat controversial uh, Buckman direct water diversion. Notice that there have been at least two bridges here. There are no bridges at Buckman now. Um, this old rickety bridge, here's the Model T or some such trying to cross it, and a, uh, a much better looking uh, engineered bridge that can hold at least several hundred sheep. These are sheep <laughs> crossing the bridge back at that time. And I suspect this is probably the bridge that was built by Henry Buckman around 1900 to haul timber that he was clear-cutting in the Jemez Mountains across to his timber mill, which is located right here in the little company town of Buckman that he built. Uh, this type of rock is common in White Rock Canyon. Thick deposits, finely and beautifully layered, and most interestingly, these rocks, these boulders that clearly have fallen into something that was wet and mucky. This is hydromagmatic tuff, and it represents a very special kind of eruption called a mar volcano. It's special because it doesn't involve lava. Here's how it works. If groundwater percolates uh, downwards and encounters magma in the subsurface, the water is superheated to steam. It uh, creates a super exceedingly violent explosions of pulverized rock and mud such as this mar exploding in Alaska in 1977. There's no magma involved here. This is just water blasting upwards. And um, as the, the groundwater repeatedly percolates downward, you can get these beautiful fine layers. Each one represents an explosion. And uh, during um, afterwards, these lakes can be up to about a mile across and commonly filled with water. Many such mar volcanoes appear to have formed uh, in along the ancestral rock, right, Rio Grande. There was water and there was magma. And it's only because of this recent erosion of White Rock Canyon that, uh, that boaters and hikers can see these lovely rocks. So Cochiti Dam marks the end of the free-flowing Rio Grande, the end of our tour. Uh, the dam was completed by the Army Corps on Coach de Pueblo in 1975 for flood and sediment, sediment control. By volume of material, it's one of the ten large earthen fill dams in the U.S. It's capable of uh, nearly 15,000 or about 15,000 CFS of outflow, but I'm told that more than about 8,000 CFS could jeopardize downtown Albuquerque because this downtown Albuquerque sits below the level of the modern Rio Grande. Now, although Cochiti Reservoir is not that large a reservoir, its effects are propagated far upstream. And uh, in great part, this is because the Army Corps has a flood easement that allows it to legally flood parts of the National Monument. And uh, the reservoir traps nearly 1,000 acre feet per year of sediment. That's 1.6 million cubic yards. So below Frijoles Canyon, where there are river flows and the sediment starts dropping out, uh, boaters have to learn to track the Falweg, the deepest part of the, canyon, of the channel. And in 1985, after an early snowmelt, the Army Corps decided to uh, retain water, and they filled the reservoir. They flooded the lowest parts of Bandelier National Monument, including archaeological sites. It killed thousands of trees. Uh, the water stayed high for three years, and 
At its high stand, the water backed up 20 miles into this canyon, all the way back up to Buckman. The uh, bathtub ring from that is still visible over most of the lower part of the canyon, the high water mark from that. There it is. So I'm going to wrap this up with the observation that threats to this marvelous river are real and they are serious. One of these threats is well as illustrated in simply in last year's hydrograph uh, of the Rio Grande at Embudo. Last year, the river peaked a full five weeks earlier than the norm. Runoff was faster than usual, and the water and the river transported less water than normal. Now, it's certainly true that the Rio Grande, the hydrograph on this river, is highly variable variable from year to year, and uh, you can't tell too much about a single year, but recall that last year was the warmest year in the United States in recorded history, and it was the second driest year uh, in New Mexican history. Now, given the accelerating effects of climate change, I do wonder if this 2012 hydrograph uh, may be the new poster child for the Rio Grande, and that over time, over a fair amount of time, a hydrograph with this kind of shape will replace uh, this current historical hydrograph. And I guess the bottom line here is that our beloved Rio Grande is going to need all the friends that it can get in the future. Now, on a cheerier note, I'm going to end with this lovely shot. Uh, in the wilderness section of the Rio Chama. Uh, two people in the audience, there, there's, uh, <laughs> there's Susan and Steve. Um, because, I show this because we're in the initial stages of uh, planning a river guide for the Rio Chama that would be similar to this Rio Grande guide. And so with that, thank you very much for your attention.